to wake up smoking and go to sleep smoking and in between smoking there was sex and then more smoking so basically my life consisted of waking up sex smoking waking up smoking sex going back to sleep smoking I thank God that my addiction never led to prostitution like I saw so many other women doing. But we could not go a day without getting an AKA hit. That's what we called it. We didn't call it crack. We called it a hit. We was like, um, I need to go get a hit. You go get the hit. I go get the hit. How much money you got? Uh, I got $10. How much you got? And then we always found a way to manipulate each other's mind during the smoking process goodness uh, I mean he find a way to always um outsmoke me I find a way to outsmoke him he say he had to go somewhere and work I say I had to go somewhere and work just so I can get my smoke on by myself crazy but real I always told myself this was a phase and I would not be doing it long during that six-year run, I overdosed four times and ended up in the hospital getting treatment. One time, my overdose was so severe that the doctors had to strip me completely naked and put me in extremely cold air and pump everything, which was alcohol, out of my stomach. The temperature was below 50 degrees to keep my blood vessels from busting in my head. I passed out in the hospital because my body became toxic. Whoa, thank you, Jesus. Became toxic because of the large amounts of cocaine and cocaine added ingredients and alcohol in my system. When I woke up, they said it could have been my life. I remember being so cold, shivering and begging the nurses for cover. My body was detoxifying. I was not allowed to have any visitors and security was stationed outside my door to keep me from leaving or anyone from getting in. The doctors were surprised to see me pull through without damaged blood vessels in my head and my heart to get back in rhythm on its own. God's hands were on my life, but that was not even close enough to stop my addiction. So you see here, you see here, um, all these things are happening. I, I am having overdoses now because I've gotten that addicted to it that I want more, more, more. And if you tell me I can't have more, that means I want even more, more, more. So you see, this is how an addict thinks. This is how an addict thinks, and I thank God for sparing my life. Um, an addict thinks that if you miss out on a hit at any time, you got to make up for that. You got to make back up for that hit that you lost, which means you're going to add on to whatever you're buying in big quantities. You're going to add on to that. And when I had those overdoses each time, oh my goodness. Uh, I remember one time I was in the Wendy's, Winn-Dixie grocery store in Rockingham, North Carolina. And I fell out in the freezer section. I fell completely out. Standing up there trying to pay a light bill high as crap and fell out. So see, we never know. And we have to pay close attention to these people who are on drugs. If you know somebody that's on drugs, you really need to pay close attention to their health. Because their health is being damaged. They're being damaged. And they may be walking around you looking cool and everything. And you may be saying, oh, they used to doing that. They used to that. But inside the body is saying, I'm trying to fight to stay alive. I'm trying to fight to put air into you. I'm trying to fight to keep these nerves from jumping everywhere. I'm trying to fight to build your immune system up. Glory to God. So while y'all think it's funny you dope dealers out there, you got a price to pay because this is murder. <laughs> this is murder. And I know a lot of people ain't going to agree with that. It's murder slash suicide. You continue to do drugs, it's suicide. They continue to sell it to you, it's murder. And that's how I see it. That's how I see it. I didn't say it like that before, but I can tell you that now that I know better. Okay. Addictions are strong. It is like fighting with yourself with self over yourself and constantly losing to yourself because you no longer know yourself. Now, what do I mean with this? What I mean with this is when a when you have addiction, the addiction, yeah, it, it affects everybody in the family, but ultimately it's you. It's you. It's a personal battle within yourself. 
And even if you get help until you look, come to grips with yourself, you're fighting with yourself and you don't even know why you're fighting with yourself at the while because you have been fighting with yourself for so long. It's a personal battle. And each person who wants to really and truly recover from it, they have to first deal with their self. Who am I? Why am I doing it? When am I getting out of it? How is my help going to be when I'm through with this? Wow. So many questions to ask and so many things to answer. Even after those four overdoses, I could not seem to stop smoking. I broke promises that I made to God that this was my last time every time. But that was a lie. <laughs> every time I came out of out of a um episode, I, I promised God, I said, I'm not going to do it no more, Lord. Lord, save me. Save me, Lord. Save me. Save me now. I'm not going to do it no more. I promise you I'm not going to do it no more. Mm. I knew that was a lie, too, when I was saying it, but I wanted it to be really good intentions. It wasn't that I didn't want saving. I just knew it wasn't going to happen then. Because I knew the whole time I was saying it that I was having a craving right then. I wanted to smoke dope. And I was having that craving as I was praying to God. Now, that's something whenever you're craving your dope and you're praying to God at the same time and you don't know who's going to... Who's going to win first? You don't know if God is going to take your life or you're going to get your dope. Every time I was supposed to stop, the urge got worse and kept worsening. It seemed like the more I spoke out loud, and, and you know, people say, speak to yourself, speak over yourself. It seemed like the more I spoke to myself, the worse my cravings got. I mean, it just seemed like it was getting worse and worse. In fact, I wanted it more than ever, and I was in love with just the thought of being a smoker. I remember I used to hear people say, there come the smokers. The smokers are here. Hey, the smokers are here. I thought that was something. I thought that was something because the streets, the devil, the devil will make you think that what you're doing that's affecting your body and harming your temple is good. He will make you think that. He will send co-workers to encourage you to continue doing what you're doing. Each time I was released from the hospital, I went straight back to my dealer and started smoking all over again. The hospital finally got where they would automatically ask me, have you been smoking today? And would give me a drug test before they would even treat me. Seemed like this deadly disease of the mind had me and I had no control. I felt like it was so many different me's that I would wake up and not know who I was from one moment to the next. There was me, the mother, me, the verbal bruised girlfriend, me, the gospel singer who could not wait to get out of church, buy a 12-pack, buy a 50 in crack while on the way home from church, and drink a half a gallon of white liquor, preferably country gentleman, which was a cheap brand, but hey, it went good with my dope. Okay, see, I had all odds against me and nobody to turn to that I trusted. We all know that a woman without control is a disaster waiting to happen. But I was determined to get off drugs. The more determined I was, the harder it was, and the more I just continued to find excuses of why not to get off drugs. Oh, my goodness. This brings back a lot of memories of it, it it just brings back a lot of memories, and I thank God. I have to keep constantly telling myself I thank God because I do, I truly do. Um, a woman that wakes up and don't know who she is is a loose cannon. I don't care how you put it. We have women every day that wake up right now and don't know who they are. They don't know whether they should be happy when they wake up or sad. And, and most of that comes from a bruise. That comes from a brusque because I can tell you, every time I would wake up and I didn't know who I was or had some kind of point of, some kind of thought of who I was supposed to be that day, if I got excited about anything my kids were going to do, that man made sure he broke me down real quick. He knew if he made me mad that I would run to the dope because that's what I was doing. That's what I was basing my life upon, doing dope. I get mad, smoke dope. And he knew that was his way of getting dope, too, because he didn't even have a job. I celebrated every victory with crack and alcohol. If something good happened on a day, it turned out to be a crack celebration. Sometimes I think that some of those victory parties were made up so I could have a crack celebration. 
I even used crack as a medical excuse, saying if I just get a dime or 20, I would feel better. I didn't, and that's the honest truth. I, I say, I got the backache, I got to go get me a hit. It'll be all right once I smoke it. It got worse. <laughs> it got worse for real. It didn't even numb it. Um, I would say, my head hurts. I need a hit. Go take a hit. It didn't, it didn't help my head ache none. It made it worse. And now I had cravings to go back and get another hit. Running in and out, running in and out, all time of night. You know, you finish you finish one hit, you think you're going to sleep. And if you're in pain, you're not going to sleep. And so you're going to get back up and you're going to run in and out all night long till all your money is gone. I remember one time I, I ran out to, I, I didn't even see 50 cent in my pocketbook anymore. Wow. That is just how a crack addict, addicted person thinks. If I can just find one excuse to keep doing it, then it's okay. And I'm excused for it. So the excuses kept coming and I kept on smoking. Pretty soon I forgot that I was supposed to be quitting. Funny how we will allow our supposed to be's to hinder our should be's. You can easily get distracted by being in the wrong company. Every time I tried to quit smoking, guess what? I would always go around people who smoke. That was a clear indication right there that I wasn't quitting anytime soon. And I'm going to tell you, whenever you're serious about giving something up and you really want God to change your life, you got to change your path. You got to change everything you do. I had to stop going down the same road. It was one road. I could not take that road for a whole, I think it was like three years. Three years, I could not travel that road because every time I went on that road, it made me want to hit. It made me want to get a smoke get some smoke, some more dope. So I had to stop taking that road until I was strong enough to travel that road. That's a lot of things people don't realize. It was certain hairstyles I couldn't wear anymore because certain hairstyles, that was my smoking hairstyle. Smoking is associated with everything, remember? So now when I get ready to quit, I got to change everything that I'm used to doing. If I was um drinking, it was certain music I couldn't hear. Certain songs make me want to ride out and get a hit. That was my riding song. My riding and smoking song. <laughs> People don't believe it, but this stuff is real. It's real. And if you are in the wrong company, you will easily get distracted. Finally, it did come back to my mind that I need to quit for my children and for my health. But I was too ashamed to ask for help from family and friends. Not to mention they make you feel so low when they low rate low rate other addicts around you and then down your character to the point that you cannot trust anyone but your drugged up self that is the worst thing that you can do if you are trying to help someone who is addicted to anything is remind them of who they are they may be strong strong out but they can remember every word that you said to either bring them up or bring them down addicts do not forget we have sensors that go off when someone is deliberately insulting us or using us as a pity story. Now, what did I mean by that part? Every addict really does want to quit at some point. They want to really quit. But when you are steady around people who are supposed to be encouraging you and the encouragers encouragers or low rating the other addicts that are around you, then you'll know they're throwing off on you. You're not crazy. You're not stupid. You're you're addicted, but nothing's wrong with your mind yet. If somebody sits around you and say, "Well, them crackheads over there, all they do is steal," well, you know automatically that they're throwing off on you too, letting you know you better not come around me stealing. So we have to be mindful how how we talk around people. You cannot go around an attic and encourage one and low rate the other. You can't do that. You can't encourage one addict while putting the other addicts down. You can't do that. Because when they go in it, they're all in it together. Addicts have parties together. One smoker knows another smoker. They greet each other. As a matter of fact, I think they're more friendlier than church folk. Now, I may take some rap for that. But to tell the truth about it, you'll see an addict, they'll gather up together. They'll gather up together and everybody will smoke their stuff, have their party. At the end of the night, all right, man, go on home. Church folks will 
gather up, have a um, big old choir anniversary or a revival. But the minute they get out.